uh, human AI interaction is going to be uh, crucial. The data by itself and knowledge reasoning by itself, I'm just not going to cut it. Data is treated as the dirty little secret of AI. When it makes headlines, it's usually for a bad reason. I'm Jennifer Ding from Encord. I'm a data scientist, data steward, and even a data festival organizer. I'm into data and I think we should talk about it more. That is what AI Data Chats is for. In today's AI Data Chat, we are here with Andrea Cortoni, tech lead at Samaya AI. Welcome, Andrea. What is our AI data topic for today, and what are you pairing it with? Hi, Jen. Well, yeah, thanks a lot for, for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, yeah, so today I really wanted to talk about and kind of dive deeper into this data topic and trying to understand how we can really connect the reasoning power of these LLMs and all the models that have been developed and how those can use data. And specifically, I wanted to focus on uh, generative data. So how can we actually generate data that is meaningful, that is factual, and how can we actually digest in other system outside the, uh, the LLMs that generated themselves? The drink that I'll pair this with is going to be uh, just very simple coffee. Uh, main reason that I do this is that, well, first of all, I'm Italian, so it's a little bit of a bias, but also it's a, a way for me to actually get caffeinated and be super concentrated and sharp. So yeah, that's a drink that I'll pair with. Caffeine and data quality, things we love here at Encore. Perfect. So please go ahead, give us your, your hot take on this great topic. Uh, the, the point that I want, I'm trying to make is with the advent of these LLMs and models in the last few years, I think we've all seen how generative data and uh, synthetic data that we can generate out of these models, it's kind of everywhere. And we see it in our daily lives, whether you use tools like ChatGPT or at work, you generate uh, some other data based on what you're doing. Uh, there is a lot of noise and a lot of information overload that may come out of these. And so my hot take is, you know, I don't think anybody has yet focused on really nailing what the, the actual usefulness of this data that we generate actually is. And that comes into, into different shapes. It may come from user workflows, but it also may come from generating vast variety of data, but actually just focusing on a sub that, subset of that data to go about any task that you're working on. And I do think it's going to be like a big driver going forward this year, but also in the years ahead, uh, in how we'll be able to build these systems, systems out and make them factual and useful for us. No, great. It's one thing to generate vast quantities of data, another to generate quality data that's actually usable, especially in domain specific scenarios. Yeah. And on that topic, Samaya brings AI to some of the biggest global financial institutions. Mm -hmm. What does quality look like for your customers and, and how do you define what, what makes for good generated data? Quality is key for all of these generated data. So just like you will use tools like ChatGPT or Anthropic, Cloud, and so on, whenever you get answers from these systems, you want to be able to, first off, guarantee quality by being factual where you can. And so, you know, whenever, you know, in the case of Samaya, whenever you're dealing with financial institutions, banks, hedge funds, and so on, you need to be super factual and very, very accurate in what you're presenting uh, to users. And at the very minimum, you need to be explicitly transparent in the way that you're doing it. So, you know, if you are interacting with these systems and you're surfacing data that makes no sense or it's completely out of touch with what you're working on, you need to be extremely careful and you're building evaluation systems for these kind of things is kind of key here. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, there is still always a space for speculation in data. Kind of a follow-up to the hot take is that you can generate high uh, quantity of data that is factual, but you can also sometimes speculate and see what actually you can get out of this data that maybe has not been seen before. Because, you know, factuality is only possible if you can rely on data that exists. But if you're generating data, sometimes it means you're making up kind of theses and hypotheses that maybe have no ground to stand or there's just no facts that can support it fully. I think there is a, a clear space for user workflows in the financial systems where you can combine these two very effectively, right? So this duality, I think it's super crucial in the way that we establish quality with clients as Amaya, but just in general, I think in the field, uh, it's going to be extremely important going forward. We had an AI data chat with Ben Burton Shaw with Hugging Face at Hugging Face, and he was talking about how vibes testing <laughs> remains so important, and how can we professionalize what vibes testing looks like? So I'm curious, what are the good vibes for financial data? To be honest, I really don't think anybody has necessarily solved the problem yet, and something that we are, you know, at Samaya working on and been working on, you know, the vibe testing. Honestly, it mostly comes from user interaction. That's the best way that you can actually build out this, um, this kind of evaluation, if you will. Uh, so like, how do you 
test the vibe of something you're generating that may either make no sense or perhaps be extremely useful. Uh, the best way is to rely on experts that know what, they, what the actual topic is. And so in financial systems, that means not talking directly to these users and understanding what the human AI interaction would look like if we were to build out these systems. And you assess the vibe in a way, just like that, uh, just being able to, you know, just get feedback as much as possible. And, you know, just like when you build other products, I think, uh, you know, LLM based products or, you know, AI based products work really is the same, if not even more, you need to overload the, the iteration loop of getting feedback from people that are using it more and more, just because again, it's a, it's a, obviously a very powerful tool. But that also means that if you don't do the vibe check at times, you may just uh, diverge completely from what uh, the actual goal is. Maybe let's dig into another hot topic of the yes. year, which is agentic AI. Based on your interactions with these financial experts and mm -hmm. experience working in the financial sector, what do you think are the biggest opportunities for agents in different data workflows in yeah. finance? I think the really key aspect here will be the human AI interaction. Nowadays, you're seeing a lot of developments with these agentic power, things like, you know, deep research from open AI. They're really, really focused on the reasoning piece and being able to really reason about the tasks that they are given. But I actually truly believe that that's only a part of the, the problem and it doesn't necessarily even solve the problem altogether. Uh, I think the human AI interaction where you are you bring in that user feedback and uh, iteration loop that I was talking about is going to be much more important than the, the reasoning power of the model itself. Uh, obviously, the models are already very powerful and will get better and better with time. And all these companies are working very hard to do that. Uh, but, you know, companies like Samaya will have to focus on building uh, a knowledge platform that people can interact with really easily. And so user workflows and understanding, for example, for these agents, what does what's it, what is an agent? Is an agent just a model that you give it a task and goes off and does whatever uh, it wants, or is it something that you actively interact with as if it was a coworker uh, at your at your work, uh, and you just go over steps of iteration with the agent itself on what needs to be done? I think that's probably that's where I'm leaning more towards, and I think I probably we'll see the most benefits because the, at the end of the day, that's gonna be the application that will give I believe us the most benefits in terms of productivity. Also in terms of like, how do these agents grow over time? How do they improve uh, quality wise, but also just productivity wise? Is it more useful to have something that just takes over completely what you're doing? Or is it useful to have something that you can possibly brainstorm with? Uh, you know, even the advent of the chat GPT and having this chat interface where you're able to easily communicate with these things. It's kind of a, the, the UX that goes into that uh, is obviously not new, but it's, it's something that really does give so much more power to the tool itself. Uh, and I think for agents specifically, this will have to also happen in some way, whether that's a chat interface or something else, I think it's uh, TBD, but the, the, that user interaction is going to be uh, crucial for sure. It's a great point that what we even mean by agents is something that is not standardized at the moment. Based on your interactions with your customers, what do you think, what flavor of agent do you think they're most interested in? There is many, many different flavors. So it also really varies a lot based on the, the use case that people are working on. So that's where I think building like a, a flexible world where you have a capability of interacting really easily with this agent is going to be crucial because at the end of the day, it's going to be very, very hard to otherwise cover every single use case uh, by just in a way like hard coding what the actual interaction is, it's just not gonna work. There are so many, many ways that uh, you can interact with these agents with. But you know, in the financial aspect of things, uh, there is many, many tasks that these people have to go through every single day, whether it's reviewing certain topics, sectors, companies, and so on, or perhaps even doing what we were talking about, or like what, how can we generate speculation, if you will? How can that happen in a user workflow? So for all these things, it's Again, it's very, very hard to pinpoint uh, an exact user workflow with which it would work. So you need to be able to build, I think, a, an interaction process that is extremely like flexible, but also it can very easily be applied and customized to all of these use cases. Yeah, I think it's an important point that one amazing thing that these new models introduce is, of course, the different capabilities such as generation or reasoning. But as you point out, it's really the different ways that humans can interact with the models that also feels quite novel. The idea that you can chat with a model in this way and, and have these conversations that that were never possible before or solve mm -hmm. problems through conversation with a model, that kind of interaction is really new. And I'm curious if there's any other kinds of interactions you think are missing or, or some 
interaction gaps we need to fill. Yeah, I mean, there, there's also different venues of interactions that I don't think they're only getting kind of explored. You know, if you look at something like a chat GPT, the, the main interaction is going through an actual language that you are typing in your laptop or your computer. Uh, but there's many other ways where you can actually do that. You know, speech, there are speech models that do this. Uh, podcasts even. Uh, there are some tools now that actually allow you to generate podcasts like what we're doing right now. Uh, you can give them a script and it, they will even generate actual realistic voices of people that are going over that script. Uh, so I think these levels of interaction obviously don't necessarily always apply to, for example, finance, but uh, there is, I think there is a large variety of ways that you can probably build these, in, these interactions out. I am still a strong believer that, you know, the chat interface is still extremely powerful and will be very powerful for the time being. Some of the things that will also come from the future are, you know, trying to distill knowledge in just a chat interaction form uh, is often not that easy. So being able to, for example, bring in more knowledge from other spaces that you may have outside of the chat interface is going to be also super powerful. Say, for example, that you are you know, trying to build this agent and you want to be able to access a large variety of data that maybe is not very easily accessible for the, for the agent itself. How do you do, how do you build the interaction for the agent to actually go get that data and look at it? So it's going to be super important to have an interaction where you not only just talk to the LLM and talk to these AI models, but you also, you basically give them tool to use. Whether the tool is go do web search or the tool is, hey, take a look at this structured data set that I have in the pocket and I need you to, to summarize for me. So the interaction of being able to introduce all these tools over and over uh, is going to be also super important. Final question for me, in terms of focus areas for an AI team like Samaya's researchers and engineers, talented, very talented for, for many different backgrounds. How do you decide where to allocate attention between model work versus data work? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a super challenging question. I think there is the balance comes based on the time, I think, of the company. Uh, I think there is times and times where innovation needs to be brought uh, and the innovation comes in different flavors. It doesn't, I don't believe it only comes in flavor of building the next model that is going to be able to do something. It comes from a, a product point of view. You know, as we were talking, how do you build out this user interaction? That's innovation in itself, if you're able to do that. Uh, and so the allocation really varies based on the use case you're working on, the time of the company, what time you are actually assessing the company in. The balance also comes from understanding that you really do need both to succeed. Models and you know research and all these things and building components that are super powerful and have very strong reasoning power is crucial, but that's not going to solve the problem by itself unless you have the actual data that can support everything that this reasoning has, has to do. And so the, there has to be a balance where you need to understand that Data is probably the basis for everything and reasoning is what brings the data to people. And so once you nail down exactly what data you need and how you, you know, you're storing it or how you're accessing it and making sure that the models can access it is probably the first step. And then as soon as you're able to do that, the reasoning power that you can build on top of that is just going to be exponentially kind of boosted by the fact that you already have that data set out. And then as soon as you build, bring this balance to teams like Samaya or a similar startups, then the next step, I think, of allocation of your time should be in how do you build a feedback loop where you now have a strong foundation of data and knowledge. You're building the expertise on the reasoning so that you can leverage the knowledge. But then how you do you understand whether you're using it correctly and feed it back into the data and close the loop in that way. Now, there's many companies out there that are also developing the models, so you don't have to do everything from scratch. So you are inherently going to benefit from the fact that, you know, OpenAI will come up with the next model that it's super powerful, the next llama will come out and so on. Well, with that, we'll move on to our final set of questions, our rapid fire round of five. And I'll kick us off with our first one. What scale of data are you working with these days? Technically in terabytes. And there's a large variety also of the, the data that we have to deal with, ranging from unstructured to structured data. And the real challenge is also like when you have these data sets that are this large and you have to feed them to these models, how do you connect the two? How do you make sure that you can leverage unstructured information and structure information in a relevant way. Building an important like retrieval system for that is crucial at this point. I think we are learning more every day that these data sets require uh, a, lot, a lot more tooling in terms of how we, we can surface the most relevant information. 
Any favorite data sets you've come across recently? Well, I'm a little bit biased because I work in the financial space. So I mostly deal with financial data. How do you connect unstructured information like raw documents? Uh, you know, in the financial space, you can think of this as company filings with the SEC in the US or public companies and so on. How do you connect that with, for example, company financials or other things that are happening in the market? that are structured information like data points of stock price and so on. How do you connect these two things in a system where you have to do retrieval and you have to do reasoning on top of it? I think you've answered the next one, but feel free to expand. What do you think is an AI data challenge that should be receiving more attention? I mean, yes, definitely. That's one of the, the challenges. I think also what we just discussed at the beginning about like um, synthetic data and generation of data is probably a, one of the biggest challenges, honestly, that we'll have to deal with, especially again, when you're dealing with a factuality. So in, finance, in the finance space, for example, you don't really have that much room, if any, to make mistakes in facts that you're showing to people. Uh, so it, it's important that if you do generate data, you're actually be able to exactly reference or be transparent about how you got to say a, a specific data point or an hypothesis of something that happened. Uh, so the a data challenge will be, how do you get the raw data? How do you reason on top of it? And then when you have the generation, how do we evaluate it? What do you think 2025 will be the year of for AI data? Uh, human AI interaction is going to be uh, crucial. The data by itself and knowledge reasoning by itself, I'm just not going to cut it. Uh, I hope that's where the world will kind of converge in terms of how we use these things uh, so then we can just enable ourselves to do more uh, and better. Final question to close out today's chat. How was your pairing of your drink with today's data topic? Great. I got very involved, so I didn't drink much of it, but I did drink some beforehand. So I'm definitely feeling very caffeinated. Well, thanks for joining us, Andrea. Where can we find more of your work? Uh, yeah, of course. So, so if you go to uh, just some IAI website, uh, you'll be able to see everything that we're working on. And yeah, super excited for what we're doing in the financial space. Uh, I think it's very applicable to other spaces too. Wonderful. Well, that wraps up this AI data chat. You can find links to our speaker's work in the episode description. If you'd like to share your thoughts or suggest a speaker, email us at aidatachats.encore.com.